so much. I'm excited to be here today to talk about so the work that's been going on with some work groups in Kansas uh, for uh, around the, the definition of neglect. And I was asked to present testimony that I provided a couple of weeks ago uh, to a collection of a group that's working on child welfare reimagined. Uh, so that's kind of where this came from. Uh, before I, I get to some of the information, I want to sort of set the stage for this. Um, Kansas has been really fortunate uh, since uh, 2021 to have been part of a national cohort of states that have been working on uh, thriving families, safer children. The uh, Kansas uh, Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund applied to be part of this cohort so that we, alongside other states, could begin to learn and engage in discussion with peer states about um, the conversations that we heard yesterday uh, from Anne with Casey and, and some others, I think, over the past few months that you've been hearing from around distinguishing poverty from neglect. And so uh, this group, uh, the Thriving Family Safe for Children, has been engaged in this work since 2021, been on a lot of national calls, and we've implemented some pieces. I've got information on who has been part of that work. Uh, we've had some parent-lived experts who are part of that group with a uh, the Children's Cabinet, Department of Education, uh, Kansas Children's Service League, and others who have been helping us, and they've just been a great group. On page uh, three of the testimony, just to maybe get you grounded with, you know, remind me who the Thriving Family Safer Children group is, that part of some of the pieces that they've sparked in terms of thinking about distinguishing poverty from neglect and uh, being alongside families in that. For example, they help spark some ideas about development of family resource centers. Uh, they are, uh, University of Kansas is helping in some of the communities that are having the conversations about four questions on the prevention side. They've been helping us uh, with that and carrying forward that. Uh, and they helped us with the National Governors Association project a couple of years ago that had some great ideas with Emporia School District around how to uh, add some positions to that school district to help out families with their concrete needs. You know, if they're sort of experiencing some stressors, the uh, Emporia School District was willing to try some new ideas to have someone on staff who could help connect families. So that's the connection or to get you grounded in the thriving family, safer children. Another one of their project priorities, which leads me into uh, sort of the next phase of this getting away from background is they were look, they reviewed definitions of neglect from other states. So that was part of their work. And that leads me into um, what I'm excited to talk to you about today. Before I do that, I did want to say, and uh, Ann mentioned this yesterday, there is national dialogue right now going on about definitions of neglect and distinguishing uh, neglect or not conflating neglect uh, with poverty. And so just for reference, um, there is a Congressional House Resolution 8813. And how this connects is it, it's labeled or, or titled Preventing Child Welfare Entry uh, Caused by Poverty Act. And it, it doesn't redefine neglect, but what it does is it changes federal funding streams so that states could actively use prevention for e dollars to be able to make sure that a child is not going to enter um, custody. So we could then use more funds to spend, for example, uh, dollars on supports related to housing instability, utilities, transportation, food assistance, other concrete needs a family might have. So that's the connection to the national dialogue is if, if this is what we would want to do, how could states maximize federal financial participation to really support that? Page four of my testimony gives a real um, brief uh, piece around what the current statute has. And you also saw this, I believe, in um, Ed Klump's uh, testimony. He had this same information. Uh, what you have uh, on this is 38-2202, part of the definitions, neglect. And I'll, I'll concentrate on parts of this that really have to do with distinguishing poverty from neglect. So the, the definition is broader, but I'm going to stay a little bit narrow. Um, so, for example... Uh, the part in Z, we do, Kansas does address neglect in distinguishing poverty in that we have um, that, that acts or omissions are not due solely to the lack of financial means. So that's our, that's our language right now. That's where we capture that. We also, um, in each of our three 
examples of it, we use the word failure. So those are sort of points for discussion that tie in um, what you could what you could pull together with poverty and neglect. Those are the key pieces of our current statute. When the Thriving Family Safer Children group was kind of looking at other states, we found a few themes. And so that review of other themes uh, are there in some bullets, and I'll just briefly go through them. So a lot of states use the word refusal rather than failure. Uh, some states use and define harm and imminent harm. Uh, Kansas defines harm, uh, uh, but we don't define uh, the term best interest of the child. So there might be opportunities there. Uh, and at least two states require a judi judicial determination of the balance of harm. And I believe um, Anne mentioned this as well in, in her piece around any imminent harm to the child outweighs the harm that will experience as a result of removal. And some states don't consider truancy uh, a harm that would result in foster care. So th those are just some themes for opportunities. I'll just go through some highlights from other states. Uh, because we worked a lot with Iowa uh, in the four questions, we got to know some of their other um, language. Like, for example, I mean, they use you know the pieces about other care necessary for the child's health and welfare when financially able to do so or when offered financial or other reasonable means to do so. So that's how they incorporate it. Uh, Indiana is an example of a state that uses the word ref, uh, refusal. Louisiana and I believe Washington uh, utilize similar language that says, you know, the inability of a parent or caretaker to provide for a child due to inadequate financial resources shall not, for that reason alone, be considered neglect. So they have a, you know, their sentence is like active tense. They go a little bit further. Uh, we learned from Anne uh, Texas language in terms of their blatant disregard. She went over that yesterday. Um, again, we've got some examples. Washington uses the term imminent harm. Uh, Wisconsin also has language that it needs to be other than poverty. Um, those are just some other states' examples. It's not comprehensive. But those are some of the states that the Thriving Family Safer Children's Group thought, well, these seem appealing. These are kind of highlights. So they're just listed. But there could be more to learn. Based on some of the work that this group has done, uh, DCF, and you heard yesterday from Secretary Howard's testimony, the, our legislative agenda has three pieces to it. And this is one. We'd like to put forward a bill uh, that would redefine neglect and uh, I have that example for you that starts on page seven. So for example, if, if we wish to borrow from language that would resemble Washington state, uh, we could change our neglect definition in Z um, to have that language, that active language that says the inability of a parent or caretaker to provide for a child due to inadequate financial resources shall not, for that reason alone, uh, be considered neglect. The existence of community or family poverty does not in itself constitute neglect. So that's one example, you know, borrowing from uh, Washington and Indiana, uh, we could change the word failure to refusal, which is also reflected on page seven. Uh, keeping going to page eight, and I'm just going over the highlights for what a bill uh, that we would love to collaborate on and, and learn more from stakeholders, but what language it could. If you take that into some pleadings, which is uh, 382234, a little bit different from the definition, but it continues that theme. You know, if a petition requesting removal of the child from the home, that the, and this borrows from Washington and Iowa, that the facts must show a causal relationship between the particular conditions of the home and imminent harm to the child. So it integrates that imminent word. The existence of community or family poverty, isolation, age of the parent, uh, inadequate housing, or, and it also includes um, when there's a circumstance of a child not meeting the requirements of compulsory school attendance by themselves doesn't constitute imminent harm. So in, again, bringing in some of those themes from other states um, to narrow that definition. We have some other language uh, in 2243 that we would propose in the bill. 
And I, I guess for today's purposes, uh, because we are beginning to share our legislative agenda and, and want to be able to work on that, we're sharing what we have and the ideas we have and the history of the work of a couple of years with the Thriving Family Safer Children group. And um, we look forward to further dialogue and collaboration on this. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Tanya. And I, I had asked her to do this presentation because I heard it about a week ago and thought it was an excellent overview. And I appreciate the, the comparisons and the examples from other states. And you don't, don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, do we have questions? Uh, Senator Erickson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Real quick, just a couple questions. Um, Financially able, how is that determined? Well, I think there could be different context um, in, in terms of neglect, uh, to the extent that neglect might include uh, lack of supervision or medical neglect or physical neglect. Uh, if they have, for example, financially able, if they have health care coverage um, that might uh, be able to provide for a service related to a medical need that might be considered financially able, that they have the resources. Uh, so I think you bring up a good question. Maybe financially able uh, isn't, isn't the best term, but I think the spirit is, did the family have access to resources or were they offered resources to be able uh, to mitigate or remedy? So that, that's a good question. God just strikes me that that's awfully, you know, subjective in determining the definition. I know families that probably don't make as much money but are able to manage their money successfully and those that have more money that don't. And So I'm just curious how that standard would be applied. And then my second question, if I may, Madam Chairs, do we, for the states that have changed this definition, were there any correlations n noted in data? Did their data change? Did you see any, you know, spike or drop in any of their data due to changing the definition of neglect? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, we've reached out to two states. Uh, we reached out to Washington and I believe Indiana, and we did that about a month ago and ask the question. Uh, for them, they didn't think that enough time had passed uh, to, to see any change in their data. They weren't offer at that time to offer any insights, but we have not reached out to every state. We've probably had the most dialogue with Iowa, again, because we had the collaborative with the four questions. I think maybe um, Anne, when she spoke yesterday, had a little bit of data from the Texas with this mess I have, I can't pull out that whole testimony right now. I tried to find it. But um, anyway, I, that's just what I can recall. Um, Senator Fascado, did you have a question? I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Tanya. So on page four, in your um, Z, uh, in number one, um, failure to provide the child with food, clothing, or shelter, uh, necessary to sustain their life. So, so are you saying maybe you'll you would change the word provide to refuse? And can you give me an example? I kind of had my own, but I want to see what you're thinking. So, let's say that individual. Um, so, the definition of neglect in this scenario here, so that individual would be receiving, let's say, food stamps, TANF. So we know they have food stamps to buy food, but they don't because they're doing something else with those stamps. Then that would be considered neglect or refusal or provide. Thank you, Senator, for the uh, question. And thank you, Madam Chair. The we would be proposing that to change the word failure to refusal. Um, and you're really looking at the impact to the child. So there could be a number of, dis number of situations um, that we, 
would be referred to us. Um, but I think it, it changes the failure and it recognizes that if you could offer a family resources or services or supports, um, that they're refusing that. It's, it's not maybe about a failure, it's about an active refusal, even when they are offered supports and services or other concrete services to do so. It just, it changes uh, sort of the active tense of it. And again, this is what we've learned from other states. To, to change one word um, might help okay. clarify in, in the extent that you want to distinguish poverty from neglect. Okay. And Madam Chair, if I may, I have just one more quick question. So on page three, um, what is your, the distinction between uh, family resource center vote versus family preservation? Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question, Madam Chair. Uh, family resource centers are an organized uh, approach in at least 10 or 11 communities that DCF helps funds, there are more than DCF funds, but they're, they're an approach where uh, a collection of services or supports comes together sometimes in a building or maybe on a campus, but it's an actual uh, provider of service or connector of service. So the resource center could be a collection of maybe maybe they have food assistance, maybe they have a referral uh, to a parent skill building, maybe they have parent skill building classes on site. So they're, they're an entity that is engaging with families in a neighborhood. Um, and then um, family preservation is a, in, in the sense that we talk about it in here, is a contract for services that DCF has that we make a referral uh, to a provider in any county in the state, but it's a very specific practice model. And those families become known to DCF. Another distinction with the Family Resource Center is those are open to any family in any neighborhood. You don't have to be DCF involved. Family resource centers are available to all. Don't have to be referred from DCF. In a family preservation referral through our contract would require a report to DCF. Representative Howerton. Thank you, Madam Chair. So if you could just summarize the reasoning for why we wanna change the definition or the, the statute of neglect. Like, is there something I mean, I have my own idea on that. What preempted this conversation or this goal to change this definition? No, I think the goal is, is to distinguish uh, that circumstances of hardship, financial hardship, um, do not equal neglect. Um, that there's a more thoughtful process to think about impact to the child, actions or inactions of the parent, and that states are being encouraged to look at our own definitions. Um, through the construct of the Federal Child Abuse Prevention Treatment Act, we're being encouraged to think about, do our definitions of neglect do enough to distinguish that poverty uh, or um, financial hardship aren't automatically neglect, to really be able to distinguish that. That's the purpose. Okay. And just for clarification, is there misunderstanding, is kind of what I was getting to, is there misunderstanding in the field or by law enforcement, by others that are trying to implement, like what, how to, when to take a child into care, and is this to, to help clarify that as well? I think it's, it's, it's helpful to clarify uh, for anyone working alongside families and seeing it in a different lens, uh, whether it's knowing when to reach out for help, um, when DCF is responding to uh, someone's worry of neglect uh, that, that might be a need uh, for support or connection um, to food, nutrition, uh, transportation, uh, that simply because of that need doesn't mean that that's neglect. It could be an opportunity for a service or a support in a different way. And, and could states look at how our statutory framework captures that spirit in a better way? Other questions? Senator Baumgartner. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Tony, for being here. Um, I, I guess to, to tag along on some of this discussion, this um, 
states that use the word refusal, I think that for us in our state and where we are right now with our contractors, that refusal implies there's been an offer to provide food, to provide electricity, to provide water. Um, and I think with our growing population of homeless camps, we are not seeing our contractors going and providing and saying, we'll pay the Evergy bill for you to get back in your home. We'll go to the city of Topeka, as was the situation last summer, and we'll pay to get the water turned back on so that you can have air conditioning when it's 110 degrees outside. So I, I have a little bit of a qualm with saying that we change the word to refusal because it truly does put the onus that the state is going to, either through our agencies or through our contractors, we are going to offer and provide these services which we haven't found a way to do yet. So I, I do have that, that concern. With regard to um, harm or imminent harm, we all know what the legislative process is, and sometimes we can get things done quickly, but most often it will take a longer period of time. What would prevent that notion of imminent harm from being a policy of the agency? that is adopted by the contractors, do we have to wait until the legislature puts it in law for imminent harm to be what they're really addressing? Um, I think that those are things moving forward that really need the contemplation. Um, it's wonderful. I mean, refusal sounds like, oh, no, nope, the parent didn't want that kid to have water. Um, Refusing is only contingent on it being offered and made available. And I don't think we're there yet as our state. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Ruiz. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Baumgartner, for that question. I, I have a follow-up with that. Does Can there also be an assumption that someone else has offered resources to that family, not just the state. You know, maybe it's uh, maybe um, um, it's some other community resource. Could be a church. It could be almost anything um, that has offered to provide that family services and not, not necessarily from the state, and they have refused. Thank you, Representative, for the question. Yes. Representative Howell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Tanya is on page eight. It says uh, KSA 38-22, uh, a sorry, I'm not reading that well. Is that our current law, our current statute right now? Is that wording below that? Is that what that is? Uh, thank you for the question. That is not current. Uh, what's in italics, or I believe it might be in your electronic, it might be red uh, font electronically. It would be new, proposed. This, this is an example of the new. Okay. Mm -hmm. of a, okay, or could be the new. Okay. Do we have in our handout our current language? Did I miss that in here that we're talking about? Uh, thank you Sorry. for the question. Uh, no, I did not provide a, in this document, a comprehensive set of each of those child need care code sections. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I didn't miss it if it was there. Um, I appreciate you bringing this forward. It's, there's some interesting ideas, and I look forward to uh, furthering this discussion uh, in this into this next session. Further discussion? Okay. Representative Owsley. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm, I'm just looking through this because I understand what the Senator's saying, um, you know, as far as an offer being made. But if we do nothing uh, with the refusal versus failure, then it's just a failure and it's not 
It's regardless of means or offers or abilities is simply failure to provide the child with food, not refusal to provide the child with food. And I just wanted to, to bring that up that I think I'm leaning towards refusal being better language than failure as it sits today. So um, just for committee discussion and suggestion, uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any further discussion? Senator Pascado. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Representative Owsley, uh, so Tanya, so in this scenario, or the failure versus refusal, give me an example of that person who refuses, fails to, or so what's in your mind of cha changing the word? I mean, are you talking about I'm already receiving DCF benefits and you've offered me some things and I've refused them. So give me your thought. Thank you. And, and this scenario isn't limited uh, to families who might be receiving an, an assistance benefit of food assistance. So uh, for example, uh, shelter, uh, failure to provide the child with food, clothing or shelter necessary. Uh, for example, and there's lots of scenarios. If you have uh, a family who's housed precariously or they are unhoused uh, temporarily, uh, they might be on that day. Maybe that situation might be considered a failure on that day. Um, if you, if maybe the the construct structurally was refusal. It, it engages the family in a conversation about, have we tried this resource? Can we connect you to this? Can, is there someone in, in your family or your neighborhood or your community of faith who might be able to help get shelter a bit more permanent or a bit more temporary so it's not precariously housed? I mean, that might be a, a simple of an example. I, and you know we're certainly open to if if the word refusal isn't right for Kansas, uh, then then it's not. Uh, but we were just borrowing from what other states have found to be successful. But I think there could be a number of examples. Thank you, Tanya. So so when people call me, I might direct them to call two one one United Way for services, but they are. Or, or right now they kind of have lack of funds. So, you know, they don't have any, you know, usually they might refer them to Catholic charities, et cetera. So that's why I'm just trying to narrow it down. Are you talking about funds or services coming strictly from the Department of Family and Children of refusing those services? Because usually sometimes even DCF well, in Wichita, anyway, I know they will refer people to call uh, 211. Then, Madam Chair, they call me. I'm like, I'm not United Way, but I got a way. I can. <laughs> so I, I, I just, you know, I look forward to this discussion as well for clarification. Thank you. Thank you. I think those resources, as you guys have described, could come from anywhere. Senator Erickson. The more we discuss this, the more it comes to mind. So I apologize, Madam Chair, but um, Representative Owsley just sparked some curiosity in. So I looked up the legal definition of refusal. And it's interesting because if you look at the legal definition of refusal, it includes a contrast with neglect. And so I just Googled, I'm not an attorney, but we have some present. Thank you. I just play one in the legislature. Um, but the legal definition from Black's Law says, refusal is the act of one who has by law a right or power of having or doing something of advantage and declines it. And then it highlights down a little bit below. But neglect signifies a mere omission of a duty, which may happen through inattention, mistake, or inability to perform, while refusal implies the positive denial of an application or command. And so that just makes me think about all of the examples, you know, the, or the possibilities that a family or child or parent could be experiencing. And I'm just very careful about 
the implication of those definitions. I guess that's just my my thought on that. And I think it it sounds good at first blush. It makes sense, but as I think deeper about the implications of what that could mean, I, I just want to be cautious about that. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I think that caution is probably important. I do. I, I'm not an attorney either, but um, I, I I I am a little curious that um, you know Black's Law definition of neglect uh, is not going to be the same as neglect as defined in the sink code and and that neglect in, in as defined in the sink code is what we really want to focus on um, but with reference to what the legal meaning of it would be so appreciate the background there um, Representative Howell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, when I spoke earlier, I didn't realize we were officially into the discussion part, so I feel a little more, okay. Well, um, I feel a little more freedom to speak uh, with that. Um, so as someone with a little bit of lived experience in this area um, that we're discussing, in knowing that the law currently uses the term failure, in the regards to and with the word neglect in our law. Um, many times we have parents who not only are struggling for money, who may even be fully on benefits, but our benefits do not cover the needs. They do not cover the needs. Okay, SNAP does not pay for children's Tylenol, for example. SNAP does not pay for sanitary napkins for mom, for example. Okay, these are basic things that single moms and children have to have. Okay, um, mom may not have a car to get to the store, to get the food, or get to the food bank to get the free food. So they're 100% dependent on family members or other people to go get those things. So the world the word failure is problematic. It is problematic. How we define neglect does matter. It does matter. And that is why we have so many cases of children in foster care in our state due to neglect. Okay? And we have a history of it. So these, these are real world children and real world families that we are talking about. And I know we all know this. I know every single one of us sitting on this committee passionately cares about this. And I'm preaching to the choir. I know this. Okay. But as I said, this lived experience right now in my life on a weekly basis. Okay. Um, so um, whether, and, and we, this is what we do for a living. We debate words and what are the word choices <laughs> and what are the right ones. And we all know we argue about them because they matter. <laughs> but I just wanted to say out loud why they matter. <laughs> and even though, as I already said, I know I'm preaching to the choir and I know every one of you know that. Thank you for letting me say it out loud. <laughs> Okay, uh, Senator Gossage, and then um, uh, we're we're going to move on because we'll we're going to open this up for some discussion. So, and that's what I was about to say, Madam Chair. We appreciate that you brought this forward. Um, I I intend that I or I've been told I will be chair of the Health Committee next year, and I'm sure that you'll be bringing that to us. This will be discussed openly in committee, and uh, this is something that we will vet. 
So I think sharing these things here and, and bringing forth opinions here is fine, but um, I, I hate to see us belabor this when we will be doing this in, in committee and determine, does it need to be changed? Does the wording need to be changed at all? Having said that, when Representative Howell was talking about lived experience, being in a family of seven, but my dad worked three jobs, and we lived in a little two-bedroom house in Wichita. My mom cut our hair, made our clothes, and my two sisters and I shared the same five dresses that we traded off wearing to school. I could see where a teacher might say, those little castle girls, I think that's the only clothes they have. We were required to wear, but they were always clean. And I never felt neglected. But I like the fact that at least we say in our law that it cannot solely be because of poverty as to be considered. I would have been considered growing up in poverty, but I wasn't made to feel that way because we there was a lot of love in our home. And um, I think that we will definitely take a long look at this and, and make these decisions when we get into session. Thank you, Madam Chair.